Elliot Isika is, uh, um, it's, uh, uh, I think, fairly well known nowadays in New York, especially after the big uh, uh, Whitney Museum retrospective that was, what, was it last year? It was on. And, um, and well, in 2002, also Carlos Basualdo had a big show with Elliot Isika's Quasi Cinemas at the New Museum. Uh, however, um, there, there's an interesting, uh, um, well, it's a challenge also to talk about Elio Tisica here now when there's uh, uh, Irene Small in the public and Alex Albero and Vivian Crockett who are all kind of specialists in, in this and I get all nervous. So I'd, I'd like to, to put it, um, I'll keep it with bodies and borders talking about, about Elio Tisica since I'm also not an art historian. However, um, there was a certain period in Artisica's life, which, um, which is, is a kind of the period he spent in New York in political exile. And there's a special period which I'm interested in, which is between his, uh, uh, one of his, uh, a milestone in his career, let's say, in his international career, which was uh, uh, his participation at the, at the um, MoMA show Information in 1970. Uh, and from there to, Two years later, what, what uh, he himself called the uh, oraculo, like with this specific uh, um, way of, of putting it typographically, uh, which is a, a scene, actually one scene of a Super 8 film he did, which is called Agrippina uh, Roma Manhattan. And uh, in this two years period, I would, I'd like to think of, you know, as, as uh, uh, what, what this has to do with bodies and circulation and crossroads, since we're talking about crossroads, right? So um, Elio Tisica participated at the uh, information show uh, as a representant, let's say, of uh, Brazilian, let's call it somehow conceptual art, right? Related to technology and, and concept, new art uh, from Brazil. There were different other Brazilian artists present. And he presented, this is not actually a, a shot of, of the installation at MoMA, but this is more or less the, the piece he showed, which are a battery of, of cabins to um, lay in, uh, uh, have some leisure time, uh, have a collective experience, or even sex. There's an anecdote that um, there was a, a couple having sex, which led Oitisika to say um, uh, in the museum, which was the greatest experience he ever had as, a, as an artist in his last interview. No, he, he doing an artwork that you know people could use for sex in a museum. So uh, he arrived after uh, the MoMA show. While he, while he had the, the MoMA show, he um, arranged to, to get a, a, a Guggenheim grant for which he returned in '71. Shortly after, while in Brazil there was the uh, military regime going on with uh, after the end of '68 with pretty severe uh, repressive politics going on. So everyone who actually could afford it, who was uh, opposed to the regime, uh, uh, who could afford it, chose to flee uh, into political exile, as did Elio coming to New York with, uh, with the Guggenheim grant, where he uh, took out his pieces from MoMA and installed them on, on Second Avenue. And uh, I forgot the address, uh, but it's, a, it's in the Lower East Side, Second Avenue, and I think Fourth Street or something, where he uh, where he had his uh, what he called a loft, which was a small apartment, and um, and he would install his cabins where he would invite people over to hang out and have these leisure experiences, consume drugs, have casual sex, um, and well, read magazines, listen to music. However, um, this whole experience, I'm going to really zapped through to, to get to the point where, where I'd like to come, which is the three crossroad situations I'd, I'd like to ask. In that same time, Elio Tisica started to, to have a severe change in his aesthetics, you might uh, realize, well, he, he chose new media to, to employ for his artworks like Super 8 films, slideshows, uh, tape recordings. He went into technically reproductive media, if you like, so which marks a difference in and his approach to, to art, the media he chose. And he started, you know, um, designing his notebooks much more. Um, he also went into a, like a, a change of aesthetics, if you like, to, to, so suddenly he, he, it, it all seemed to become much more gay, uh, openly gay, let's say, while in, 
in Brazil, his um, development was pretty much about uh, uh, liberty, freedom, and the body, um, and the central, liberating the central experience, and so on. Like the, the um, it started becoming much more aesthetically cliche, if you like, uh, gay aesthetics. And uh, so you, you could think of, you know, did he come out of the closet or not? Um, and he, he, he started uh, being interested in, in, you know, explicit sexuality, like as you can see here uh, in the middle, uh, photos by Luciola, photos of Luciola, of a transsexual, fresh operated cunt, as he writes it. Um, so he, he gets all interested about, you know, like really explicit, sex and drugs things and uh, very explicit aesthetic around it. You can also see that he kind of revises, he reviews his uh, uh, former um, works like the famous Parangole Capes, which are these, you know, which are usually uh, presented in a very exoticized way, you know, like uh, 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 black Brazilian samba dancers with, with you know, these capes uh, and suddenly he, he draws them into uh, reviewing them through a kind of, let's call it, gay lens. And he, um, he changes this whole concept, but still, you know, insists in keeping it to the Barangolet uh, concept. So there's a severe change going on. This is what I, you know, I'm trying to show you here in, you know, very brief. He also started to doing strange things with the Barangolet, which we, there's no real study about it, but probably the most adequate thing to say is he was looking for some sort of Pan-African alliance of, you know, the Parangolet experience from the favela of Mangueira and Rio de Janeiro, pulling it into the Harlem subway kind of experience. And I'm not really sure. Uh, there's some 16 millimeter film, you know, footage of uh, this performance, let's call it which is uh, unfortunately, it was wrongly developed. And so you almost, you barely see anything. It's all gray. And, but there's these photographs where you see Elio kind of offering the, the Parangolet cape to some people in, in, in the subway in Harlem. It's, it's kind of weird. I, I, you know, it's really weird. What, what is he doing? What is it about? But what, what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, there's some, there's some trouble going on in Oitisika's projection uh, of his artworks and of what is reviewing his, his own work when he arrives in, in New York. And that is owed to, and this is, uh, this is my, okay, let's skip that. It's going to take too long. But um, that's owed to what, what I'd like to describe as crossroads, given the topic of, of so I'd like to ask what kind of crossroads is it that brings us to uh, Elio discovering the queer underground in the Lower East Side uh, around uh, Jack Smith and in particular in the figure of Mario Montes, um, which he includes into this uh, oraculo scene in Agrippina, Roma, Manhattan, which is the, um, this is the oraculo scene. Um, which shows uh, Mario Montes doing the throwing dice with Antonio Diaz, a, a Brazilian contemporary artist of, of Elio Tzika and friend who uh, was in New York at that time, even though he went into exile to Milan. And um, these two figures, um, what, what uh, Oitisika called Smith's tropicalism related to Jack Smith's uh, 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 the presence of, of Mario Montez in Jack Smith films, and what Antonio Diaz, you know, one of the exemplary, uh, let's call it Tropicalia uh, um, artists, you know, around the whole Tropicalia uh, uh, period. So um, Oitisica would do this oracle, and this oracle, the oraculo, or oraculo, it's not really clear, you know, how he meant it. Um, however, uh, would show Mario and and. Antonio Diaz throwing dice. In the Super 8 movie, it's a kind of durational shot where you have them standing on Fifth Avenue in front of the Flatiron building throwing um, dice. I have, this is how he, you know, put it. The, this is Christine, one of the actors, a Brazilian actor at that time, a girlfriend of um, the filmmaker, Ivan Cardoso, with whom he had a, 
uh, intense dialogue at that time. It's wonderful photos that Ojisika made. It, it's rare to see them actually. Um, so uh, that is them. And so, um, so this crossroads made this change, right? So what do we do with this crossroads? Now we're sitting here in, at MoMA, uh, where, where this whole thing started, like right, one, one street is MoMA, the other is, what is it? Um, what do we do with this crossroads? I'd like to propose three uh, ideas on, on this. Well, first of all, um, to get back to the bodies in circulation, uh, bodies and borders, um, sometimes what moves is not so much the person, but all the circumstances around it, right? So what changes is the, the circumstances we live in. Um, this might be a sort of um, migration or might put us on crossroads without us moving so much. So one of the interesting things is that when Elio Tisica comes to New York, this is, uh, the, the, this is symptomatic for a really you know, huge geopolitical shift that is going on. We're talking about the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. So what happens when, when the uh, Brazilian military regime sets in and all these uh, um, oppositional artists move away into, um, into exile, Elio Tisica moves to New York. And what does he find? He finds all these kind of uh, lofty Lower East Side situation, right? There's a, there's a lot of lofts. The art scene in New York is like, there's a lot of space still. And what he can observe is um, that this space is diminishing. It's being capitalized. Why is all this space uh, there? It's there because New York went through a severe phase of deindustrialization, right? And all the, 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 the buildings that were used for storage, etc., they got free and all these artists installed themselves into, in, into these kind of proto or in these industrial storage facilities, etc. And uh, um, so Elliot Tisica comes to New York at a moment when uh, 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 the, the so-called first world is being in a process of uh, uh, severe deindustrialization while Brazil is being heavily industrialized, which is interesting because obviously the movement that happened is that industry went from uh, uh, the US uh, being outsourced to uh, southern countries like um, Mexico or Brazil in, in the case of Latin America. So we have a kind of contradictory movement, right? Not contradictory, but there's a, there's a crossing while Elio Tisica um, packs his, you know, let's, let's put it in a, in a, a pictorial way, um, packs his things to flee from the military dictatorship in Brazil where there's, you know, this abstract art uh, uh, going on. He moves uh, to, to New York where there's this uh, conceptual thing going on. In New York, there's a severe moment of deindustrialization. Brazil is being industrialized. Elio Tisica does not only take his things, but also orders a lot of cocaine from his friends in order to make a bit of money, selling it after his uh, um, Guggen uh, Guggenheim grant runs out. And, and um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of movements going on, of drugs, people, music, art, industry. So there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's shaken up, like really shaken up situation, which amongst others uh, reflects in, and this is the second crossroad, I like to point at in, in a, a different notion of politics. So Elio Tisica, who was uh, uh, famously uh, uh, the grandson of, of one of the icons of Brazilian anarchism, uh, José Tisica, um, he, he had an anarchist upbringing, right? His family was a, 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 a holding this tradition of anarchist education up and he was homeschooled, etc. So he comes uh, uh, to New York with this background, not only the anarchist tradition of from his grandfather's side, but also, you know, he was, um, he was an admirer or like a, one of his, let's say, mentors or father figure was the uh, member of the Communist Party, Ferreira Goulart, who was an advocate of popular culture, became it at least, or the uh, post-Trotskyist internationalist Mario Pedrosa, the art critic. So he had this baggage of his notion of politics and then he gets to New York, and suddenly he encounters uh, Black Panther Party, gay liberation movement, feminism, and you know, things start changing for him. He writes letters and he says, you know, look, there's really all these things going on here, and he changes his aesthetics, obviously, right? So, so the, the discourse he had on the liberation of the body that, that was you know, so severely contrasted with abstract forms and geometric abstract forms, they would, um, 
they would suddenly turn into something else. He would, you know, go after um, this, what I call the Pan-African experience of the Parangoleo. He would go after, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Black Panther aesthetics uh, in what are his Cosmococcus later, or he would, you know, go into the gayification of the Parangolese. And uh, so something really changes and he learns to know what is, um, you know, like uh, the new left, if you, if you like, that, it's that simple, right? Broad. So this is an encounter, this is a crossroads for Itisica. He comes out of this context in, in Brazil under military uh, dictatorship and he encounters, you know, in the, the global metropole of liberalism in New York, encounters uh, the new left movements. The third thing, the crossroads, what can we do with this crossroads, which is probably interesting, um, is that this allows us to have a look uh, and review art history. What happened with art history? Art history has constantly, and this is interesting because it shifts from Brazil to the US, for example. Um, in, in Brazil, there's this kind of tradition, and a lot of Latin American scholars uh, um, go, go after this to try to somehow invisibilize this period of artistica. You know, the, the gay uh, advocate of drug consumption, self-determined drug consumption, um, uh, kind of like urban New Yorkian uh, Oitisika is, is sort of invisibilized in a lot of um, uh, uh, histories of Latin American art of that period, which is strange. In Brazil, uh, traditional art history doesn't want anything to do with, with those stories. They say it's not real art. So this is the tendency, at least. And while, on the other hand, um, when uh, there's big retrospectives in, in New York or in um, Chicago and uh, uh, Pittsburgh, um, obviously, the fact that Oitisika was in New York is, is being heroicized in a way, right? So, because it's, everyone takes what is useful for them. So we can, we can review art history in a way that not only, you know, um, we can face the challenge of seeing, you know, getting into some sort of comparative uh, uh, reading of Oitisika. What does it mean to see Oitisika from, you know, in the New York context to bring him back to, to Rio? What does it mean if we read, um, Oitisika in Brazil through uh, New York eyes. Uh, what does it mean to read uh, New York through the eyes of a Brazilian? And this is the last point. I just want to close in this. Um, what does this oraculo then say to us? I would say that these crossroads, they have to, and it's a bit our, our um, I think, our, the, the task, our um, tarea, what is it? It's our task. What we have to do is um, to think the crossroads as two roads cross, at least. So it's not only um, that we can review Elio Etisica from this New York experience. We can say, you know, there is a significant change in his understanding of the body, the representation of the body, um, um, a reviewing of his whole career as an artist. Um, we can review, actually, Otisica's early works, right, when he kind of openly comes out of the closet. Uh, with his works, we understand that his first very famous works, which are these, you know, wooden yellow uh, closets, actually, which are called the penetrables. You can go in and out of a closet, of a yellow closet. You know, like we, you, you, you just draw your picture, right? So we can we can review Artisica severely from his New York experience. On the other hand, this means that we can review like the status that our icons have for us. You know, these artist icons. You know what? You know we can review them, but not only through New York lenses. Elio Tisica, and <laughs> this is the task. We can invert the point. I wouldn't go away here heroizing New York that blatantly, um, because we can also, if we take serious Elio Tisica through New York eyes, we also have to see that revising our icons means the local big superstars of the early 70s that Oitisica all in all generally condemned as very boring. Uh, uh, reactionary and um, what, how does it call it? Bourgeois, right, of course. So, <laughs> Elio Tisica's ultimate verdict when he came in a letter to Ivan Cardozo, who I mentioned before, was you know, there's so much reactionary going on, uh, reaction, reactionarism going on, uh, such a bourgeois art scene. So, this is the interesting thing to stand on this crossroads, right? Depending on which way we go, our heroes may all fall. And, um, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk. <laughs>